Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, a gunman opens fire on the packed New York subway. <laughs> the morning rush hour turned terrifying. He had a, a mask on and a vest and was shooting people. The hunt for the gunman and his motive. Two men in Toronto shot and killed at random. These men were completely innocent. And police say the suspect was prepared to kill again. A blast of winter in April. This storm has been described as historic. The blizzard tracking towards the prairies that could be the worst in decades. A COVID surge right before a holiday weekend. We're going to stick to seeing our family. We would not make any plans to see family this weekend. Should you keep your plans, go outside, rapid test first? We ask the expert. This is The National. A manhunt is underway in New York City tonight after an attack at a subway station in Brooklyn. It happened during the busy morning commute. Police say a man wearing a gas mask set off smoke grenades on a train before opening fire on the crowd. They say he shot 33 times. Ten people were hit. Five are in critical but stable condition. Now, Paul Hunter joins us now from outside the subway station. Paul, police gave an update on the investigation tonight, and they now have a person of interest. Hey, Andrew, yeah, Frank R. James from Philadelphia. Police found a credit card in his name at the scene. They found the keys to a rental in his name at the scene. And tonight, there is a $50,000 reward out in his name. <laughs> Morning rush hour, underground in Brooklyn. Suddenly, with smoke in the car ahead and a banging noise, possibly someone trying to escape as passengers here moved away, frightened and confused. When it pulled into the next station, they all poured out from both cars. Smoke, panic and blood now everywhere. There was blood on the floor. There was a lot of blood trailing on the floor. All I saw were people trampling each other, trampling over each other, trying to get through to the, the, the door, which was locked, and it was just a lot of panic. Witnesses say a man dressed as a construction worker had put on a gas mask, set off a smoke canister, and began shooting, striking multiple people. There was a young man who came up to the station, station booth, which was some yards away from me, and... He was bleeding from the legs. I was scared. I didn't know. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know. I just got off the train. I stayed by some police officers, and I just I hope for the best. I saw a lot of people coming out of the train station, screaming, yelling for help. I saw a lady when she was shot right in her leg. Um, she was shot in her leg. Yeah, and um, she was screaming for help. No one knew what was going on, who was shooting, or why. Police said later it could have been much worse. Consider what they found at the scene. We had 33 discharged shell casings, 15 bullets, five bullet fragments, two detonated smoke grenades, two non-detonated smoke grenades, a hatchet. My fellow New Yorkers. New York's new mayor, Eric Adams, who campaigned pledging to fight crime, could not visit the scene having just tested positive for COVID. He sent these words. We're praying for all New Yorkers who were injured or affected by today's attack. Paul, you hear the words New York and attack, and a lot of people immediately think terrorism. Th that's something police were asked about today. Yeah, they were asked, and they said, look, they're not ruling it out, but at this point, they are not thinking that that's what was going on here. But look, you're right, this is New York, this is America. That was the first thing people thought this morning. When we left Washington to get here, there were big men with big guns, police, with sniffer dogs out at the subway stations in Washington. They don't fool around in this stuff uh, in this country when that's a possibility. What it is, is another signal to many New Yorkers of this uptick in gun violence we've been hearing about two years into the pandemic. People are frustrated with the economy, with vaccine and masking. People are angry. There has been an uptick in gun violence, not only in New York, but in other major urban cities. And people in New York tonight are fearful that this is just another indicator of that. Paul Hunter in New York. Thank you.
Toronto police have arrested a suspect in two random and unprovoked murders, including a marketing student from India just 21 years old. Police say the arrest likely prevented more killings. Thomas Degla shows us the grief of the student's father, but he begins at the scene of the crime. Of all the commuters who pass through Toronto's busy Sherbourne subway station, police say a 21-year-old college student was chosen at random last week and killed. He was shot multiple times and he was in a defenseless position the whole time. Only three months ago, Kartik Vasudev left his family in India, celebrating one last time before flying to Canada, a country chosen partly because his parents considered it safe. He was very innocent. We have sent him for to achieve his goals, to, to fulfill his dreams, not for the murder. Two days after Vasudev was killed, police were called to another eerily similar scene. They say 35-year-old Elijah Mahipath had been shot while out running errands. Police traced a suspect to this Toronto home, and on Sunday night, the tactical squad arrested the alleged shooter, 39-year-old Richard Jonathan Edwin, who police say had no connection to either victim. Like downstairs, I heard them, like him getting arrested. I heard like get on the ground. Inside, police say they discovered an arsenal of legally obtained weapons, including handguns, rifles, loaded magazines, and other ammunition. I will not keep quiet without justice. I want justice for my son. Flags are flying at half-mast at Seneca College, where Kartik Vasudev studied marketing until he was killed on his commute to a part-time job. It is actually the daily routine of the students, you know, traveling back and forth to the campus as well, back and forth to their workplace. <sighs> May his soul rest in peace, I would say. Yeah. It's, it's very disheartening, you know. Police say the suspect has no criminal record, but they're now looking into whether he may have carried out previous attacks. Police are convinced if the man hadn't been arrested, there would have been more people killed. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Well, we are tracking a major snowstorm that will be felt across southern Saskatchewan and Manitoba. You can see on the map here just how massive this system is. Warnings are in effect across the region. Environment Canada says it could be the worst in decades. Flights have been cancelled, the Jets game postponed, schools already closed. Cameron McIntosh shows us how else people are preparing for what's shaping up to be a dangerous spring storm. These guys came back for spring. They may soon wish they stayed south. As a blizzard bears down, Lisa Kopachinski is like many, preparing. I'm going to go to Safeway and st uh, stock up on some groceries before this ridiculous storm comes on. Check it out. It's already hitting North Dakota. This is one TV station's weather cam. Yes, whiteouts happen here. The Colorado low has been on the map for several hours now. But Environment Canada forecasts this may last a few days, dropping between 50 and 80 centimetres of snow in parts of southern Manitoba and Saskatchewan. This storm has been described as historic. This after a winter where Winnipeg and much of the prairies had near record snowfall. Most of it is now gone. Still, words like historic are concerning. Historic is April 1997, Manitoba's infamous storm of the century. It shut down the province for days and became the flood of the century, nearly washing out Winnipeg. This time, provincial officials say a late cold snap should prevent a major flood. By the time the snow melted, comes later April, uh, most of the flows we see on the red start to d d drop down. Call it winter's encore. In southeast Saskatchewan, Weyburn is also bracing to be hit. It's just kind of one of those things that you can just kind of shake your head sometimes. Remembering the whiteouts blocked roads and power outages of that last historic storm, stores are getting shopped out, classes are being cancelled, even an NHL game has been delayed. While dozens of flights in and out of Winnipeg and Regina are being cancelled, so good timing to get out now, especially if, like Karen Dietz, you have a ticket to Cuba. You'll be thinking about it over a drink by the pool. Absolutely. <laughs> you know it. For everyone else, snowy times ahead. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. All right, so let's bring in CBC's meteorologist and science reporter, Johanna Wagstaff. Joe, we need your help here. Can you walk us through the timing of the storm? Adrian, the storm is really just getting started for central Canada. 
through the overnight, we're going to see snow and winds ramp up for southeastern Saskatchewan and southern Manitoba. Near blizzard conditions are expected overnight and through much of Wednesday, which means near zero visibility. Let me show you the snowfall totals we're expected, expecting by the time we hit Friday. And that's the key here. This is a long duration event. We might actually see snow ease off for Winnipeg and the Red River Valley Wednesday night, but then coming back in full force Thursday and Friday for totals that look like this, a widespread 20 to 40, but big bullseyes of 40 to 60, even 80 centimeters as we get those easterly winds piling that snow up. And Adrian, this is why we're calling this an historic storm. Okay, that's pretty astonishing. I mean, as is some of the language being used around the warnings, it seems pretty clear officials want people to take this very seriously. Yes, I'm really seeing that in forecasters' language. The consistency with our, our weather forecasting has been very accurate in the days leading up to the storm that is now unfolding. So high confidence that this is going to be a high-impact event. And I'm seeing language I haven't seen before from Environment Canada, near certainty of highway closures and power outages. Environment Canada even posing the question in their forecast, are you taking this storm seriously? And I think there is a level of weariness uh, this time of the year, especially this year. So uh, this is going to verify, as we say in the business, and Environment Canada are really hoping people take this seriously. All right, Johanna, thank you. You're welcome. Well, to Ukraine now, which received another ominous signal about the state of the war, this time from Russian President Vladimir Putin himself. He called the current state of peace negotiations a dead end, which leaves the war very much alive. There are daily assaults in the eastern Donbass region. To the south, in Mariupol, the city's mayor estimates more than 20,000 civilians have died there so far. And Russia is said to be focusing on a Ukrainian-held industrial area, where there are unverified reports of a chemical weapons attack. Active fighting obscures much of what's happening now, but one of the first major battles for Ukraine was at the airport near the Kiev suburb of Hostomel. Chris Brown went there to see up close the deep scars this war is leaving. The enormity of the destructiveness of this war is astounding. On the very first day, one of the key battles was fought here at the Ukrainian airbase in Hostomel, just north of Kiev. Uh, they have lost their elite. Uh, airborne battalion that attempted to capture airport here. A senior lieutenant who goes by Starsky was one of the defenders and says Russia attacked with 34 helicopters. Ukraine shot some down, like this one, but not all. And so the Ukrainian commander shelled the runway to prevent the invasion force of airborne troops from landing. I think that uh, it changed the future of our war. Russian forces eventually did capture this place, but with the element of surprise gone, Ukraine won it back after a ferocious fight. This is a Ukrainian T-64 tank. It was disabled by the Ukrainians before they pulled out of here and then buried in rubble during the Russian occupation. But it might be repairable and could be used in the battle ahead. As surviving Russian forces from Hostomel and elsewhere are redeployed to Ukraine's eastern Donbass region, the man who started this war justified it again. <laughs> Appearing beside the Belarusian leader, Vladimir Putin called it noble and dismissed the horrific accounts of Russian atrocities in places such as Bucha as fake. Some Ukrainian defenders in the besieged city of Mariupol claim Russia has used chemical weapons on them, an incredibly serious allegation that could prompt Western escalation if true. We take the claim very seriously, said Ukraine's Vladimir Zelensky, but notably he did not offer any proof and confirmation may be difficult. At Hostomel, one of the other casualties of this war is the world's largest aircraft, the Ukrainian-made Antonov 225, nicknamed the Dream, now gutted. But the lieutenant says Russian losses here were far worse than Ukraine's. I think uh, we will uh, succeed on Donbass as well. Uh, first of all, because we can use our, re um, our reserves. And of course, uh, they have lost a lot of their elite troops during those very first day. Uh, days of uh, invasion. 
Even with between 8 and 18,000 of its soldiers killed, Russia still has an immense army. And Vladimir Putin has signaled he won't end this war until he gets something he can call a victory. Chris Brown, CBC News, Kyiv. Ukrainian security services say they have arrested a prominent pro-Russian politician in Ukraine with deep ties to Vladimir Putin. Viktor Medvedchuk had actually escaped house arrest on treason charges just days after the Russian invasion began. Officials say he was using a Ukrainian military uniform as a disguise when he was most recently recaptured. He's the leader of the largest opposition party in Ukraine, calls the Russian president his personal friend, and claims Putin is godfather to his daughter. Back in Canada, nearly 150 people are out of their homes, and some say they lost everything because of yesterday's fire in Vancouver's Gastown district. It took some 12 hours to put the flames out. More than 70 people lived in the low-cost, single-room occupancy hotel. Another 75 were forced out of a neighboring building by those plumes of smoke described as noxious and carcinogenic. Both buildings are now condemned. How we're going to get those folks back on their feet and into safe, warm, dry housing is a huge challenge. The displaced residents were scattered to various city shelters. The women's support group that managed the building that caught fire is collecting donations of clothing and other necessities. And in Nova Scotia, one man is dead. His brother is in critical condition after they were swept into the water last night in Peggy's Cove. The landmark is surrounded by rocks and treacherous waters. Despite signs warning tourists, it is the most common location of drownings for the province. Well, turning to COVID-19 now, and urgent new advice from Canada's top health officials. If you haven't gone to get a booster yet, go now, because the virus is virtually everywhere. Lauren Pelly looks at the situation across the country tonight. Different cities, different provinces, but the same warning. All across Canada, doesn't matter where you are, it's very likely that Omicron variant, the BA2 sublineage, is spreading quite widely in your community. Federal data shows reported infections peaked, then dropped this year, but they're rising yet again. And limited testing in parts of the country means the true number of COVID cases is likely higher. In Nova Scotia, where there is still widespread testing, the province is now averaging roughly 1,000 new daily cases, a new pandemic high. I am deeply worried that people don't understand this is already here. Saskatoon's latest wastewater testing shows a more than 700% increase in viral load. More people are going to end up in hospital with, you know, the stretching the, the already uh, exhausted healthcare system. Already hospitalizations are ticking up in multiple provinces, including Ontario, where more than 1,300 people are now in hospital. Emergency physician Dr. Steve Flindle says many of his recent COVID patients were unvaccinated seniors and people far younger. I see a lot of kids. Like yesterday, I had at least a half a dozen kids under the age of five, all in with fever and typical COVID symptoms. Uh, a couple had already tested positive on rapid tests. To blunt this latest wave, the key message from Canada's top doctor today was get a booster shot as soon as you're eligible. Even if you've been infected, you should get a booster, but you don't really need to get it um, until about three months uh, out from your documented infection. That advice is still meant to be layered on top of other precautions, like staying home when you're sick and wearing a mask, whether or not there's a provincial mandate. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. Now let's pick up on that thread of mask mandates. It's not just health experts pushing to bring them back. Across the country, a growing number of school boards, teachers, parents and students have taken up the call. Deanna Sumanak johnson shows us how they're taking matters into their own hands. As Ottawa teachers and students get sick and classes get cancelled, some say one measure could change the picture. This school board trustee is pushing to bring the mask mandates back. A decision is expected later tonight. When our chief medical officer of Ottawa uh, wholeheartedly feels that uh, masking needs to be another layered protection in our schools in this current wave of uh, the pandemic. I need to take that seriously. But Ontario school boards are on their own. The province is still resisting to bring school mask requirements back. 
So we've not seen any significant threat to the uh, health of children. In British Columbia, modeling suggests another wave is afoot and this mother worries. It doesn't feel safe for schools. Her province was one of the last to adopt school masking in the previous COVID waves. Kayanta Martins hoping they will bring them back for this one. I mean, we should be taking care of our kids, especially when kids under five are not vaccinated. They are lacking a huge protection that a lot of us have. And in some places, just having a little more information is making the choice to mask or not easier for some parents. Toronto District School Board now tells parents of all the cases reported in their school. You know, and it's still, uh, I got some uh, email and it's still children is getting COVID inside. So this is not like what you don't like, what you like. This is like important for our health. Understand now? Does it make you feel a little safer? Um, it, it, it does. Do you know why you wear a mask? For now, if school boards don't mandate masking, some parents and kids are choosing to do it for themselves. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, the sixth wave is hitting just in time for another holiday weekend. But this time, families have to decide what to do without restrictions. We're really looking forward to spending time with family this weekend. We would not make any plans to see family this weekend. What you need to know if you're thinking of gathering. Plus, the British Prime Minister pays up for partying during lockdown, but for some, it's too little too late. To have a government treating us for fools, we deserve better than this. But first, inside a Canadian-led NATO mission on Russia's doorstep. We feel like we're important for once, like really doing the real thing. We're on the ground with troops in Latvia. We're back in two. CBC News, The National, named Canada's best national newscast at the Canadian Screen Awards. Dozens of people have been killed in the Philippines in floods and landslides caused by Tropical Storm Meggy, and thousands have been forced to flee their homes. This just months after a typhoon devastated the region. Rain and mudslides also causing destruction in South Africa. Dozens have been killed in the eastern part of the country and buildings and major highways were washed away. The military has been deployed to help with rescue operations. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky spoke to the Lithuanian parliament today warning that if Russia isn't stopped, the neighboring Baltic states could be next. Canada is leading a NATO mission inside one of those countries, Latvia. Briar Stewart shows us what they're training for. Not far from the Baltic Sea, Canadian troops are in training. In this exercise, preparing for battle in urban environments. Around 700 Canadian troops are on the ground in Latvia, including a battery which arrived from Quebec at the end of March. We feel like we're important for once, like really doing the real thing, you know. So it's a nice experience, I'd say, yeah. Canada leads the multinational battle group here. Given the growing security threat next door, it's increased the number of troops and extended the mission indefinitely. You can take seat here, and you have the uh, uh, position to observe around. Master Corporal Joseph at Nicholas Marshall arrived in December before the invasion. We track what happened right now, and we try to, do, to, to train to be better. We, we never know. Well, Canada has bolstered its presence in Latvia. NATO is calling for the country to spend more on defence. Canada still falls short of the target set by NATO, which is 2% of GDP. And there's talk by NATO about the need to create an even larger, longer-term presence in Eastern Europe. But in Adagi, the community which borders the base, not everyone feels reassured. If there's an escalation of the fighting and NATO will at some point get involved, well, to have a base like this so close is not a plus, this woman said. We are living too close, so if something will happen, um, we are the first one. Still others believe an unprotected border is a bigger threat. We are a neighbour country and, I mean, we could be included, I guess, in the war. 
NATO and Canada are quick to stress this mission is about deterrence and growing at the request of the Latvian government, now increasingly nervous, watching what's going on beyond its borders. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Adagi, Latvia. Well, this coming holiday weekend will be like none other during the pandemic. In most places, there are no restrictions to keep loved ones apart. Easter two years ago, my parents waved at my kids through the window, and it was one of those heartbreaking moments. Up next, the uncertainty Canadian families are still facing and what they're doing to keep themselves safe. Plus, many are planning to take rapid tests before gathering, but can you really trust the results? Some expert advice coming up next. Welcome back. For many Canadians, this coming weekend will be a real family affair. Easter, Passover and Ramadan. People will be able to mark the holidays without COVID lockdowns for the first time in three long years. That alone is something to celebrate. Although with the sixth wave, uncertainty remains over how best to gather safely. As you'll see, different families have different approaches. Are you going on the news? Mm -hmm. So we are sending our kids to school and preschool this week. We're not doing anything differently and we're really looking forward to spending time with family this weekend. My name is Rena. I am based out of Toronto, Ontario, and I have two kids, three and seven years old. This year is going to be a stark contrast from Easter two years ago. Two years ago, my parents waved at my kids through the window, and it was one of those heartbreaking moments I know a lot of us have experienced. This year, with everyone in our family being vaccinated, us knowing who is seeing whom outside of our own family, and just being really like open with our communication, we're, we're excited to spend time with family. To be honest, I don't even know what the regulations are anymore. <laughs> I've lost track. We're not uh, doing anything that I consider high risk at this point. My seven-year-old, he wears a mask indoors right now, as do many of his classmates. They are? Yeah. And my three-year-old, they still have mask mandates for their preschool uh, because they're unable to get vaccinated. I also have decision fatigue, like many parents do. I still think to this day, there is risk associated with every decision we make. Do we go to the zoo? Do we go to see, take the kids to a baseball game? Um, are we gonna say yes to a birthday party? We're gonna stick to seeing our family because that relationship is really important for my kids and for, and for the mental and emotional health of the grandparents as well. Okay guys, time to get ready to go to school. We have made the difficult decision to pull our children from in-person learning and move them to full-time remote learning for the rest of the year because we no longer feel that there are any reasonable community level mitigations in Ontario at this point. My name is Mandy. I live in London, Ontario, and I have three children who are seven, eight, and 10 years old. In our home, I would say that we definitely feel abandoned by the provincial government and by the chief medical officer of health as well. We know that there is lots of evidence to support masking as an ongoing preventative measure. It's one of the easiest and most effective mitigations that we have, really. Um, and so to decide to take them away as this wave is, is upon us and infecting so many more people, that to remove them... Um, it's just unconscionable, I think. The situation that we're in in our home right now, having the kids in remote learning while we work remotely as well, is absolutely not ideal. It is challenging and it's chaotic. And for at least one of our children, um, remote learning is absolutely not where they're most kind of engaged. If we had not made this decision, we would not make any plans to see family this weekend. And if our children were in school, then they would be essentially not just using, but exceeding what in our house we think is a reasonable amount of exposure. What I'm hoping for going forward is that um, through advocacy that, um, you know, citizens like me can advocate for bringing back some of the protective measures that we know work. 
So, folks uh, right across the country are probably thinking right now about how to prepare, right, for the upcoming holiday weekend. So, we are going to bring in Dr. Peter Uni, the Scientific Director of the COVID-19 Science Advisory Table, to give us a little bit of perspective on this. So, Dr. Uni, you know, the last time we were having this similar sort of conversation was around Christmas time, and the advice then was, you know, rapid tests before you see family members. Is that what people should be doing now? Actually, before Christmas, I didn't say that anymore. Why? Because we already had Omicron. No? So we need to be very careful with the rapid tests. Only if you test twice negative, you know, within a time frame of 24 to 48 hours, you can be sure, OK, I'm not having an infection, including an asymptomatic infection. So that's one of the issues. And of course, the other issue is we're in a wave. We have really, uh, again, high numbers right now, meaning be selective with um, your contact. So uh, who do you see? Uh, you know, how family uh, one actually approached it, I, th I felt this was completely okay. They're selective, they don't, you know, go into high risk settings. Um, in addition to that, you can use rapid tests, but be careful, positives you can always believe, negatives only if you do it twice and if you don't have symptoms. Dr. Uni, let's talk about that, that last piece of the puzzle here. Can you explain what's happening with the tests? I think we've all heard stories of people who say, I am sick, I feel terrible, I keep testing negative. What's going on with this variant in the tests? Oh, absolutely. We have a problem with Omicron and probably also with BA2 that it seems to be less sensitive. Our daughter had COVID in class. She's symptomatic right now. She already has had three negative rapid tests. I don't believe it yet. I want to see a fourth one. We need to be very careful. It's different now. It worked tremendously well with previous variants, not that much with Omicron. Therefore, just, you know, take things with a grain of salt if the tests are negative and repeat and what is the story, if, if I may, with BA2? Again, anecdotally, we, we keep hearing that people are saying, you know, you get sicker faster with BA2. The symptoms show up faster. Is any of that true? Well, what we see is with Omicron in general, BA1, BA2 or other subvariants, they are fast, but some people get sick only quite late in the process. So it's, you know, a, a high peak early, but then just a long tail to the right, which uh, makes things very difficult. It's certainly so that uh, if you, uh, you know, have had three days, four days after exposition, plus two negative rapid tests, you could say, OK, probably it's OK. But again, make sure that you space these two rapid tests 24 hours apart. And just out of curiosity, Dr. Uni, I mean, what is the trend that we're seeing? when we do talk about these variants and subvariants, I'm talking about the BAs, but, but also XE, right? I mean, what is mm -hmm. the trajectory of, of COVID in Canada? So everywhere, you know, what we see now is that uh, variants will just continue to evolve or, or recombine, as we've seen it with XE, and uh, the only those that are more transmissible will remain successful. Everything else dies out. And we already have a tremendously uh, a transmissible virus with Omicron, BA1, and now BA2. XE is, again, a little bit more transmissible. That's certainly so. What is also important just to realize, the virus doesn't care about severity. So it just uh, will, will just point on transmissibility. And, uh, and uh, we will probably not see with XE that it will get much more severe based on that it's a recombination of two different Omicron variants. But we don't know yet. It's too early. Okay, Dr. Peter Uni, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Well, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been fined for breaking pandemic restrictions, and the news isn't going over well with some. To have a government treating us for fools, taking us for fools, we deserve better than this. Coming up, the growing anger and the renewed calls for his resignation. But first... From Kharkiv to Ottawa, a Ukrainian family fleeing the war and carving out a new path in Canada. Welcome back. The life of a refugee is a life severed. Ukrainians fleeing the war often traumatically cut off from everything that was safe and familiar before. But for Inna Savska and her daughter Anna, Canada is more than just a refuge, it's a new home linked to the one they've left behind. Figure skating for me, it's my life. I feel like I'm at home. 
I'm in Nasavska. I'm with my daughter and with my mother left Ukraine because of war. I live my happy life and I have my lovely job as a figure skating coach in Ukraine, in Kharkiv. I live with my husband and my daughter and my son, but my son Denis is living here for one year already. I'm really worried about my husband in Ukraine. When I came to Canada, we bought new uh, skates because we don't uh, imagine our life without it. I'm Anna. I'm 17 years old. I'm a student of Karazin University in Kharkiv. But now this building absolutely destroyed. And um, when I skate, uh, honestly, I'm feeling like it's a freedom for me. Yeah. It's very unexpected situation for me. And uh, my relatives and friends and neighbors, all of them help us, all of them support us. How incredible I like you to have them here. They are life, they're well. I'm taking every day as a gift with them. My name is Anna Plugatier and uh, we have been hosting my cousin Ina, her daughter, for about three weeks. when the war started. So we were thinking we have to get them over. There was no hesitation. That was not something that we would ever hesitate. Family has always been very important to us. I feel like it's my responsibility to walk them through this. I don't know what people who are coming without any support will do. They will have to rely on, you know, the kindness of of Canadians and, you know, other Ukrainians who are here to help. There was a lot of you know, driving around to different places, trying to navigate what we need. I knew right away that uh, we needed to find a place for them to live. People need to feel normal, to feel back in control of their lives again. So recently we helped Ina and her family move into the apartment. The move itself was incredible show of how community comes together. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you. We're just so happy to be able to help. Thank you. Thank you. We are happy to help the community in any way. We are so moved by their strength and optimism. They bring us uh, all furniture, all kitchen staff uh, send us kindness and love. <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's, it's so pretty and amazing. I, I have no words. They did not plan to move anywhere out of Ukraine. They want to go back. So I hope they get that wish. I really hope war will end soon. I think I will go to university or college. Before my life, I skate. Now I continue and try to skate here. It's my dream to work as a figure skating coach here in Ottawa. And we hope uh, our life will be good. <laughs> I hope so. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson is facing growing anger and now a fine over the infamous Partygate scandal. It's not only breaking the law, it's lies, hypocrisy. Coming up, why some think the punishment doesn't go far enough. I'm Allie Janes in for Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Frontburner. Food shortages and government criticism stem from a COVID lockdown facing most of Shanghai's 26 million residents. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.
might have to clean this up for TV. Well, tributes are pouring in for the man behind that instantly recognizable voice. Comedy legend Gilbert Gottfried died after dealing with a long illness. Known for his caustic humor, Gottfried's career spanned decades. His last perform performance rather, was in Canada about two weeks ago here in Toronto. Gilbert Gottfried was 67. Good morning, sir. Good morning, how are you doing? All right, good morning. Good see you, thank you. And actor Johnny Depp was in court today in Virginia for a lawsuit against his ex-wife, Amber Heard. Depp is suing Heard for $50 million U.S., claiming she defamed him in a 2018 op-ed about being a survivor of domestic abuse. The trial is expected to last six weeks. Now to the U.K., where there are renewed calls for Prime Minister Boris Johnson to resign after police found he broke the law by attending a party during COVID lockdown. Ellen Morrow now on the Prime Minister's punishment and how the public is reacting. I wasn't with her when she died. Lindsay Jackson's mother, Sylvia, died of COVID in the spring of 2020. Rules then meant no funeral, no chance to mourn with family. Part of me thinks I've been a fool for not breaking the rules myself and for not going and saying to hell with you, Boris Johnson. I'm going to be with my mother when she needs me. Today, I've received a fixed penalty notice from the Metropolitan Police. A fine he's event. already paid in for breaking his own government's rules. In June 2020, a surprise birthday party for Johnson happened here in the cabinet room at Downing Street, a time when social gatherings indoors were banned. It did not occur to me uh, that this might have been a breach of the rules. But of course, the police have found otherwise London police are investigating 12 gatherings held in government buildings. At least 50 fines have been issued, including to the government's chief financial minister and Boris Johnson's wife. When the Partygate scandal first broke last year, Johnson denied it. That there was no party and that, and that no COVID rules were broken. Will you take responsibility? The loud calls for him to resign then are now being reignited. People have an obligation, if they're going to sit in positions of power, authority, to play by the rules. Yeah, it's not only breaking the law, it's lies, hypocrisy. But what has changed is Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Johnson in Kyiv over the weekend has positioned himself as a close ally of President Volodymyr Zelensky. I'm disgusted, utterly disgusted. Jackson says Johnson's apology means nothing to her. To have a government treating us for fools, taking us for fools. We deserve better than this. But Boris Johnson is unlikely to go anywhere with a conservative majority in parliament. So long as his party's MPs stay on side, Johnson stays in office. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, London. Well, after the break, a longtime server at a Halifax diner feels the love from her loyal regulars. Most of the signatures that you see are people that come here every day. That gift of appreciation is our moment. Next. Cousin's Restaurant is a classic diner in Halifax. It opened in the 1960s and is one of the few remaining today. And for customers who've been going there for years, there is one familiar face they rely on. Brenda Monroe has been a server there for 35 years. Her regular customers surprised her with a special token for all of her hard work. And it's our moment. Presented to Brenda and Monroe on behalf of your loyal customers. There's a waitress in here who's been here for 35 plus years. And I said, I'm going to make a plaque out of that, have it framed, and have all of the local customers sign this. Most of the signatures that you see are people that come here every day. His order is always ham over easy, dark whole wheat, not burnt. Thank you, love. You're welcome. Huh? So she's more than a waitress, she's a friend. And I said, you know what? She needs to be recognized. Some hot coffee coming your way. I enjoy my job. I really love my job. I have the same attitude every day I come in. Is that a tear I see on your face? <laughs> it's possible. I never expected it. I appreciate it, guys. I really do. 
I love working here. I love working with my customers. <laughs> and I don't know what else to say. I'm speechless. Well, we love her. <laughs> I'm yeah. so speechless. Yeah. That's lovely. That's awesome. So um, <laughs> to the good folks who run Cousins, do not be offended by this, but some of the customers said the only reason they keep going back is because of Brent. I'm sure the food's fantastic, too. <laughs> right. um, but they said that as soon as she sees them approaching, she just immediately calls her order and doesn't even wait for them to yeah. see it. She knows what it's going to be. Hard to believe she started when she was 19 years old. She says so much has changed since then. She's married. She has two kids. But she never lost that passion for the job and the customers. Hmm. That's The National for this April 12th. Have a great night. Good night.